Hi all, as everyone joins, I've been learning some cool things about the ocean recently. How long, if we got one of those like Monsters Inc doors and we put it at the bottom of the Mariana Trench and we opened it and it like teleported to the surface of Mars and the ocean slowly, and the ocean were to drain through it, how long do you reckon it'd take for the whole ocean to drain through the door? See if anyone throws anything into the chat on that. Similarly, I found out that if you drop a normal marble from the from just above the Mariana Trench, if you drop a marble from from above, then it would take about six and a half hours for it to hit the bottom. The ocean is so big. Um, so Marcus guessed maybe five hundred years. Now it'd be like on the scale of tens of thousands of years to drain the whole ocean through a little door. Um, ocean's big these days. Um, one of the things that we often cover in these kind of topics is about ocean dilution. And we go into a lot of depth about how, you know, for such a long time we've thought of, by the way, this, this hasn't started yet. I, um, I'm told that there are still people joining, but I'm just rambling about things to fill the time. Um, but yeah, so many things that we think go into the ocean and then slowly break themselves down or <clears throat> dilute themselves to a non-dangerous level, but Sadly, not the case with these things called forever chemicals, like oxybenzone and stuff. Anyway, right, okay, let's begin. So, um, should I, I might just spotlight myself. Oh no, I can't spotlight myself, so I'll just keep talking. So, hello, I'm Matthew Schwibman, speaking to you from London. I wish I was there in Cornwall with you all. Um, my partner and I are planning our summer migration to live close to our partners at the Eden Project very soon. Um, so I'm an environmentalist, a scientist and a head teacher at AIM High. AIM High is an educational organisation whose mission is to make world-class live learning accessible for all, for all ages, backgrounds and cultures. And today I'm running a masterclass called Breaking Down the Echo Chamber, How to Shift Paradigms and Change Behaviours at Scale. Um, and it's going to be based around a series of interactive examples and I'm going to invite you all to be involved. Um, so these examples are taken from AIM High's courses, um, everything you need to know about climate, nature, and how to make a difference. Now, our courses are designed for the general public, for teachers, and then there are different ones for businesses seeking to inform their employees and position themselves as sustainable leaders. Um, we've had up to 17,000 concurrent people on these courses before and up to 100,000 on other Aim High streams, and that's the scale element. Uh, we will primarily actually focus on the behavioral change element. Um, so the reality of the crisis as well can be very scary and isolating for people. And so joining sessions live really brings people together. And it was something I mentioned before is that when you have an interactive live session that really works, it keeps people engaged and 95% of people or more are there at the end. Um, it creates a powerful sense of community and that's part of the kind of change equation. Um, Anyway, so yes, as I said in my talk this morning, we cannot and we will not solve this global crisis without education. The crisis is too multifaceted and distributed. And the road down which education is just a procedural tick box is one heading towards calamity. Um, so if you like what you experience here, then please join one of AIM High's full courses or write to us about getting your business or place of work involved. We are working with businesses big and small running sessions for thousands of employees through to handfuls of executives with whom we have a lot of bespoke elements to explore highly specific science and notions. Um, so as we go along now, please feel free to comment and interact using the chat whenever you'd like. There's no such thing as a stupid question. And please never feel your questions will be distracting either. The AIM High team and I are used to selecting questions from a torrent as we go when we have hundreds of thousands of people on these things. So please also feel free to respond to one another's comments as we go along if you'd like to. Right, please check that your chat is working now by typing your favourite crunchiness of peanut butter into the chat thread now. Um, so I'll wait for those levels of crunchiness. Got some smooth mega crunchy from Peter. Um, people always seem a lot more territorial about crunchy. They, they, there's a lot of crunchies coming in. I should buy like smooth. We found out that most of the AIM High team like smooth. Anyway, this is not relevant. So when we run this course as a whole, it's designed to cut through the misinformation and fake news. Um, 
so to give everyone the to equip everyone with the key knowledge ideas and, and confidence that they need and we want to weave we want everyone to be able to weave stories and understanding about climate and nature into their plans and conversations from chatting to friends through to what they do at work and the decisions they make in in life and work as well um, however today our focus is going to be on breaking down the echo chamber so engaging and reaching people who aren't already inside the bubble so this isn't limited to climate skeptics, deforesting the Cerrado and drilling for fossil fuels. This includes people who are disengaged, people who are dragging their feet, slowing down our businesses, our personal lives and the prospects of a livable planet in the future. So as we go along, consider carefully how topics are entered, how they're explained and how they might shift behaviours, and then imagine what the impact would be if it was massively scaled up. Facts alone rarely change the minds of many people, especially if we don't fully appreciate the full picture. We are creatures of stories and ideas. Some things stick in our minds and some things really shape us. So here we go. First of all, who knows what's going on here? What is going on here? Still no suggestions. I saw a few people lean forward as if to say they were gonna they were gonna put something in. Okay, so sometimes um I'm about to eat a turtle um from Robert. So sometimes it can be hard for male butterflies in the rainforest to find salt. And so if they're running really low, then sometimes they'll stop off to drink the tears of a friendly turtle. The females get all the sodium they need from mating with males. Um, but anyway, this uh this isn't really where this session begins, but it is kind of beautiful, isn't it? Anyway, this is where it really starts. So thank you for coming. So here's a piece of paper. Now, how many times do you think you can fold a piece of paper in half before it's impossible to keep going? How many times can I fold it in half before it's impossible to keep going? Okay, Ruth is saying seven. I don't even know if I can manage seven. Oh, but Mark and Heather are both saying 12. Yes, okay, great. So the world record is actually 12 times with a really big, piece of very thin paper. Anyway, with a normal sheet of paper, there's a limit because every time you fold it, the thickness doubles and eventually it becomes too thick to bend. Now, I know that we can't keep folding this piece of paper in half, but if we could keep doubling its thickness, then how many folds would it take until it was as thick as the entire earth? What do you reckon? Just give me a guess. Got an earth from Mark, 150 from Andy. Um, it would be as thick as the earth in 37 folds. Okay, so the Milky Way galaxy is so big that it would take over 100,000 years for a text message to reach from one side to the other of it. So traveling at the speed of light. Now this is actually Andromeda because it's a bit tricky to photograph the Milky Way these days. Anyway, how many folds do you think it would take before this piece of paper was as thick as the entire Milky Way? Two hundred fifty-six from Mark, a nice round number in the binary system. Um, no, it would be, ah, Peter's got it spot on. <laughs> it would be 83 folds. It would only take 103 folds before this piece of paper was as thick as the observable universe. Now, why is this important when thinking and talking about the climate and nature crisis and, and leading? Um, it's because we humans aren't wired to intuitively understand how quickly things can grow when they speed themselves up. And it's nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed about if you guess numbers that were wildly wrong before, because it's how we humans all naturally think. Now, on top of this, we've only really evolved to act quickly when we're faced with media threats, like a hungry tiger running at us to snatch the sandwich we're holding or, or otherwise. We never evolved to be instinctively scared of problems that investigations tell us are going to be dangerous if they don't feel dangerous now. Now, does the climate crisis feel scary to you right now? Is your adrenaline pumping? 
Mark's saying no, exactly. Mine isn't either. So understanding this is really important if we're to overcome some of the biggest challenges we face and help to communicate and act in ways that inspire and bring people along with us rather than alienating. We need to know this if we're to lead. So, for example, one of the most positive things that any of us can do is to remind and empower people and organizations who could take positive actions but are delaying doing so, but there really is no time to lose, to patiently and kindly paint a picture of urgency. Now, um, this is something that we talk about a lot in these lessons in general, um, but to make it clear early on, we all have much more power to change the world through seemingly small acts than we intuitively think we do. And at the end of this session, if there's time, I'm going to show you why. Um, anyway, unfortunately for all of us, just like the folding piece of paper, it is true that elements of the climate crisis are speeding it up as it develops all the time. So let's talk about tipping points. So or let's talk about feedback loops, sorry. So a feedback loop is a situation where something happening affects the chances of it continuing to happen. And a good way to explain this to people is to think about eating. So let's give Mr. Creoso a baguette. Um, now, when we eat, it makes us want to eat less. And that is called a negative feedback loop because acting on being hungry makes us less hungry. But imagine if eating more made us want to eat more though. That would be a positive feedback loop and it would end badly. We would explode. Now, of course, negative feedback loops are all across nature. We get too hot and our body tries to cool us down, right? And as the world gets hotter due to human activity, the oceans absorb 90% of the extra heat and other mechanisms work to try to cool the world back down. But what if the world getting hotter actually started to make the world get even hotter? What if the hotness started to accelerate the heating? Okay, so I'm conscious of time. And so what I'm going to do is skip forward a little bit now. But this section was about tipping points and feedback loops. And it explained without a single chart of CO2, although I didn't quite get to the tipping points bit. Um, it explained without a single chart of CO2, yet it's much more likely to influence people and change their behaviors and their ability to build resilient structures for the future when they fully understand things from the ground up. Um, and I'm just going to see, this looks like a question from John, but it's a long one, so I'm just going to read it. So it's taken the Earth over two million years to evolve a creature that is capable of expediting the evolution of the planet. How dare we interfere with those changes just because it will make it unpleasant for the current inhabitants? Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question, but maybe we can come back to that at the end. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to do next is take you through another section that's more about helping people to, to understand um, through, through means that are much more relatable to them. Um, so there's a big craze at the moment for sustainable toilet paper. What percentage of global trees do you reckon are cut down each year to make toilet paper? Mark is saying maybe 65%, Kate thinks maybe 10. So the answer is just 0.0003% of global trees. Paper is a red herring. Now, what do you think is the main reason that forests are cut down around the world? Okay, so Mark's hinted on it with soya. So exactly, as, as Kate and, and Beth and Jane are saying, the answer is farming. 91% of deforestation in the Amazon is due to farming. Now, just to jump outside this again quickly before we carry on, um, this kind of experience is the, thing, is the kind of experience that, that really shapes people because everybody realizes that there's this total commonality in having these misconceptions. We all have these misconceptions. And there's nothing to feel ashamed about. Um, there's, there's not, I mean, I think that science is often explained very much from on high in this very kind of like um, academic way. And ultimately the beauty of science is not that it's all understood and it's something that you should know. The beauty of it is that we don't know most of what there is to know. And by having these experiences where people experience those 
um, these common misconceptions together, it really helps to shape people and helps to remove that guilt for not understanding these things in the first place. Um, okay, so moving on, um, here's a map of the world. Now the very dark green is wilderness, and then there's a sliding scale of how much humans have altered it. Dark red is the most altered land. Now notice how much of what hasn't been altered is uninhabitable deserts and tundra. Um, so of the habitable land, so land that's reasonable to live on, how much do you think is built up or urbanised? So all of our towns and cities. So Jane is thinking maybe 10% and Mark's thinking maybe three. So the answer is only about one percent, maybe a little more. Our towns and cities don't take up that much space and perhaps the reason we feel like they do is because we're in them all the time. How much of the habitable land do you think is used for farming? Andy's saying 85, Bethany's saying 80. So yeah, much, much closer now. The, the farms take up about 50% of habitable land. Now to make space for much of that farming, since 1950, we've cleared about half of all temperate and tropical forests. Okay, now let's look at how that farmed land breaks down. So what I've done is I've represented all the world's farmed land with a nice strip of moss. Now, you don't have to remember these numbers, but having a feel for them is, is useful. So 77% um, of the world's farmed land is used for producing animal products. So meat, eggs, milk, and so on. Now, the reason it's so large is not because it's all covered in animals. Much of that land is growing crops to feed these animals. Now, why do they need so much land to grow their food? So while people answer that, I'm just going to bring in this quote here, which is actually from uh, my uncle, who was a pig farmer. Um, so I've always said that what I do is very inefficient, taking vast quantities of edible grains and turning them into a really small amount of meat. It's so wasteful when you see the whole process from start to finish. There must be a better way to feed everyone. Now, one of the first things many of us learn in biology at school is that eating things is really inefficient and most of the energy is lost. And it's a simple truth that most of the energy in crops is wasted when we feed it via animals to make food from animal products. How much of our food do you reckon this 77% of land produces? Exactly. It's about 20%. It's actually 18% of our food. Okay, now let's look at that other bit of farm plants. So we're going to look at the 23%. So that's growing plants for humans to eat. So it supplies um, about 82% of our food, so almost all of it. So now I wanna look at protein as well. So you might think that most of the protein we get comes from animal products because we're taught to think this way, but actually it's only about, oh, okay. it's only about 37% of it. Most of the protein we eat actually comes from plants, so about 63% of it. Now, there's a bit of a worry here with these protein numbers because they can easily be twisted to mislead people, and it's key concepts like the one I'm about to explain that are why, um, why a lot of AIMHI's work exists, so that people can cut through the misinformation and lead and help others to do so. So these numbers make it look as though we still need to eat animal products to get enough protein. What they're not saying is that most of us in the world actually eat way more protein than we need. And furthermore, we never evolved to eat anywhere near as much animal products as we've come to eat in the past few decades. Roman gladiators were mostly vegetarian and extremely strong human beings. Almost all of us can easily afford to reduce or entirely stop our intake of animal products and still get plenty of protein. This 63% we get from plants isn't 63% of what we need, it's 63% of what we eat. Um, now, normally we would then couple these things with understanding about, um, about extinctions and the disappearance of nature all around the world, but we won't have time for that. But I just want to skip to this as like a piece of 
very simple use of charts to, to, to grab people's attention um, using things that are very much true. So I want to show you, you might not have seen this before, although some of you may well have done. So this chart shows the distribution of land, mammal, biomass on Earth. So what, that, what this means is that if you were to take all the mammals on land, including everything from elephants, lions and squirrels to dogs and humans, and you were to put them all in a big pile, then about 36% of that pile would be humans. What percentage of the pile do you think would be all of the world's wild land mammals? So tigers and beavers and mongooses and antelopes and wolves and bears and so on. All the animals you see in nature documentaries. So Mark is saying maybe 20%. What do others think? Robert's saying maybe five. And Liz thinks maybe 10 as well. So this is the illusion that we are given by the nature documentaries. All of the world's wild land mammals would be just 4% of the pile. A huge amount of the pile would be sheep and all of the world's wild, and all, oh sorry, sheep and all of the domesticated mammals like horses, cats, pigs, and so on. And then about, oh, about 40% of this pile would be cows. There is so much cow on the planet, it's unbelievable. And remember how much, well, actually we didn't talk about that, but I would normally talk about how much land cows take up as well. For thousands of years, cows have been a very integral part to our society, turning inedible grass into food and power to pull farm machinery, leather and so on. Um, and they are deeply embedded in our culture. But times have changed now. We're now in a time where one third of the world's food is now wasted. We're not desperate for food anymore, nor power to pull farm machinery nor, the, nor leather. Now the priority is safeguarding nature because nature is one of the most important climate solutions, if not potentially the most important one. Um, now, yes, there are some people on earth who are very much still subsisting on cattle farming for whom it's a matter of life and death. But for most of us, adding to the demand for more cows is crazy. Um, if we were to look at birds, um, the skew is even more extreme. 70%, uh, oops, 70% of all birds on planet Earth nowadays are chickens or other poultry. This is very much the age of the Anthropocene. We've changed the world on such an enormous scale that we're teetering on the edge of radical change and potential collapse. We're often led to believe that the climate is the epicenter of this crisis, but it's, it's arguably not. It's the loss of nature everywhere we look. Now, by explaining these things clearly to people, it makes the conclusions compatible with a livable future undeniable. People who understand these things act not because they think they should, not driven by guilt, but because they fully understand. They're fully bought in and they want to be a part of the solution. Imagine if every worker or even every human on earth knew these quite simple um, ideas. Okay, so what I wanna do now is share a story with you. Um, and it's a story about these monkeys and this ladder. So a load of monkeys are in an enclosure. And at the center of the enclosure is a ladder with a load of delicious bananas at the top. Now every day the bananas are replaced with fresh new bananas. Now one day some humans decide to set up a perimeter around the ladder. Oh, we're gonna close in two minutes. Oh, well, let's see if we can get it all in. Now, um, if any of the monkeys cross the perimeter, then cold showers are activated across the entire enclosure and all of the monkeys get wet. And the monkeys don't like this. And so they start attacking any monkey that goes near the ladder. Now, very quickly, all of the monkeys learn that no one is to climb the ladder. And next, over a period of time, the monkeys are replaced one by one. And each new monkey learns from other monkeys that it shouldn't climb the ladder, even though it's never experienced the cold shower and so doesn't know why. But eventually all monkeys have been replaced by new monkeys and none of whom have ever experienced a cold shower, but they have all learned to attack other monkeys that go near the ladder. Now the humans then turn off the showers. What do you think happens next? Exactly. So for a long period of time, the monkeys continue to attack one another for going near the ladder, even though it no longer makes sense to do so. And eventually there will be pioneers that will break this pattern, but it could take a long 
time. Now, this experiment wasn't ever carried out exactly as described, but similar experiments have shown how normal it is for, oh, right, we're absolutely running out of time. Uh, but anyway, I would talk more about kind of ingrained normalities and things like that, but maybe I should just go straight to the very and just tell you about the work that we're doing and where you can find it. So we'll be, we'll be running public courses again in July and the link for finding those is here. Um, but also if you'd like to learn more about our courses for businesses um, and especially the bespoke tailored ones, then the email address to write to is that and the link is there. Um, word of mouth multiplies like folding paper. So please help us to change the course of history by getting as many people through this as we can. We already have a lot of large businesses and small businesses going through it, but the more we can get through, the more we can change the world more rapidly. Um, so thank you again all for coming. And I'm sorry that we didn't have more time for Q&A, but um, really appreciate you all taking the time to join me. And I guess